Hello? Oh, hey. You guys want to test? Check, 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 check. Here. Check, check. Can I talk from here now? No, to, like, thanks for asking. Into Great it. question. Oh, now I'm, now I'm really... All right, I'm going to shake my coffee, which is the oh, sign that I'm ready. Yeah, that's um, probably the, the way to start. Okay. Phew. Okay, thanks so much for being here. We're just going to start because uh, we don't... I guess it's the right time. Uh, thank you. My name's Tom Hart. I run the place called the Sequential Artist Workshop, and we're doing um, something... Here we go. Called... Uh, pre-internet oral history, mini comic oral histories, where we're trying to collect stories about people that made their own comics and um, also distributed their own comics and and uh, what kind of like networking technology and community that, that entailed uh, before the internet. All of that stuff. How did the hell did we do that before the internet? So we're collecting these um, uh, online and we're, we're uh, saving them at the University of Florida and I'm talking to Billy Ireland about saving them as well, and I think tonight's is, or today, today's is going to be recorded, and we'll save that as well. It's also a podcast, so if you want to point your podcast app or whatever to 90s mini comics oral history, you'll find it. There's a couple dozen up there already, and um, I'm, if I'm talking fast, it's because there's a lot to cover, and I just want to get through it. Um, so our subject today is uh, community and technology, and the core questions that I think are that I want to ask, but maybe we have better questions that will get answered, are um, who were you trying to reach when, when you had this impulse to make comics, um, and how did you do it? Um, and that's a, there's a little bit of community and networking there, but there's also technology, you know, and we've heard funny stories in our oral histories of people like hand bending the staples because they couldn't figure out how their stapler worked, you know, in really, really weird, funny ways that we either connected or manufactured things. So we're hoping to hear some stories like that and just whatever else moves. So here's our panelists. We have Peter Cooper, um, 1971. I, the earliest thing I found, because Peter sent it to me, is a zine from 1971. But Peter's also celebrating a reissue of Ruins, which you should go find at uh, Self Made Hero, right? And uh, Insectopolis, when is that coming out next year? Uh, May 2025. Okay. Um, Carol Lay is here. You should all be amazed that you're in the same room as Carol Lay. The earliest thing I found was Twisted Sisters from 1980, but I know you did stuff before then, so I hope we'll correct the record. Oh, why did you have to use that photograph? Uh, <laughs> oh, well, you know why? Because it's... I, I it's found, the only one out there. I, it is. Yeah, I found everybody. Cameras. I found the earliest photos I could. And we could talk more about that. But you have my time machine. Is it out already at Fanagraphics? Yeah, there's a few... Awesome. A couple boxes that got lost, but... They have some at Panagraphics. I've been hearing that story a lot today, oh, okay. actually. Okay. Ariel Bordeaux, we have 1993 Deep Girl up there. Um, and Clutter came out two years ago from Field Mouse, and you can find that there. Do you have anything new, newer than that, or Clutter is the most recent thing? Okay. And Anders Nielsen sent me a proactive nihilist uh, zine cover from 1994 in Tongues. The hardcover's out now, right? Uh, no, it's out uh, next March. Do we? Oh, what? Okay, <laughs> um, so what can we buy upstairs? Um, the, all the individual issues of tongues are still just barely in print, and then you know, prints and like various okay. other things. Awesome, now's your, now's your chance. Yeah. So the hopeful schedule is we're gonna do real quick intros, um, three minutes each or so, then we'll do a lot of chit chat, which is part two. Part three, if we get to a closing, I'll ask that question, and part four, We'll take some questions from you all. And we're trying to do this in, nobody's told me, 90 minutes, right? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so here we go, comics and community before the in internet. So I'm going to ask each one of you, what, uh, when did you realize you could make comics, or make your own comics, and what were, they, what were the first comics you made? And so I have um, some slides, and I have, so we can start with Peter. <laughs> and you can obviously tell us about that image, too. <clears throat> um, so uh, I, I am a late comer in terms of the making of comics, but um, that's me in the front row and my friend Seth Tabachman in the back row. We grew up in Cleveland together, and uh, we both came together um, over comics, uh, particularly when we were 11, and we started doing a fanzine, and, uh, um, and just were really rabid fans, and uh, managed to find comic conventions and go to them starting in 1970, and... Um, and so, yeah, it, this is a party that has been going on my whole life. <laughs> and, but I, it was really it, kind of late in high school that I was reading tons of comics and, and then um, 
uh, I started uh, probably smoking pot and reading underground comics. And um, then uh, at the end of high school, it, it just dawned upon me, I, you know, in the event of war, I'm a hostage. And I, unless I find another kind of job I can do. And so um, I, I started running as hard as I could towards doing some kind of art. And um, uh, I moved to New York for a uh, job in animation. And somebody said I could just paint background, blue backgrounds on the Raggedy Ann and Andy movie. And when I got there, the guy had no idea who I was. And the movie had collapsed. And, and I was in New York. And so I stayed. And I managed to get my foot in the door at Harvey uh, inking Richie Rich, which is highly ironic, I guess, <laughs> considering the direction Amazing. things have taken. So that, but I, a lot of it, and because I was in, had started going to comic conventions early on, I met a, a lot of, I mean, it was, everybody was very accessible, and I met, um, uh, Howard Chaikin was one of the people I met, and I bumped into him when I was, first got to New York, and he said, hey, I need an assistant, do you want a job? And it was filing, and then slowly doing some coloring, and then eventually I was doing, you know, sort of full-on work on, on different graphic novels, and that was another sort of entry into being part of the comic scene. But I still found that I wanted to do things that weren't superheroes and, and more alternative. And so my friend Seth and I, um, he had moved to New York also from Cleveland, and um, we started a, fanzine, a zine called World War III Illustrated in, when we were in art school. And um, the latest issue is just coming out, so we've been doing it for 40 six years, I think, 45. What is Gaslight up on the screen there? Um, that, so this is a, uh, um, and stop me if I'm going on too long, because I already feel like I'm overdoing it. Um, we'll get so uh, this was a fanzine that Seth and I did, and we were interviewing people, we did some rudimentary drawings, but we did start to write comics, and we got this guy Gary uh, Dumb to draw them, and he did the cover of this one, and in Cleveland I also met Harvey Picar, who was working, he was just a guy who was working at a, uh, um, hospital, and he had some comics, and I managed to get in his front door because he had comics, and uh, um, he started working with Gary Dumb on American Splendor later. So, how old were you in 1971 then? Um, 12, well, 11 or 12. Cool. All right, we'll get, we'll keep going. Thanks for that great intro, um, Carol. Sorry about the photograph, but I just thought it was really charming because that's San Diego Con 1982, y'all. Was, and I've got another photo of San Diego Comic Con. Anyway, tell us, how, what were the, when did you first realize you could or should make comics, and what were the first comics you made? Um, I, I studied fine art at UCLA and gave up fine art and was kind of lost for a while. I uh, was hanging out at a science fiction bookstore and started meeting uh, illustrators or you know people, and it was tangential to comics, and I went to a convention in Orange County, and I met people like Sergio Aragones, uh, Bill Stout. Um, I can't remember if Dave Stevens was there, but um, Mark Evanier. And what year is that? Ish. Oh, boy. Uh, late 70s. Uh -huh. um, so anyway, Mark recognized my potential, and uh, I needed a job, I learned how to letter. Uh, lettering is sort of like starting in the mailroom um, because you can, you know, letter, lettering's very important to a comic page. You know, it looks like an afterthought, but no. Uh, it leads the eye around the page. So I was graduated to um, lettering comics for Marvel and DC and they were, sending me these gorgeous pencils by people like uh, uh, Buscema. And it's like, I was terrified. How do I, you know, I, I'm gonna spill ink on it for sure. But once I got past the first page, it's like, just do it. And then I would copy the pencils that uh, Bus John Buscema did and taught myself to ink. Um, started getting uh, writing and, and cartoon, you know, jobs from Hanna-Barbera that was sent overseas. Um, and I was also doing illustrations for the LA Reader, LA Weekly. And um, one of the art directors offered me space 
on the front page of the, I think it was the LA Weekly. And I did a five page sequence. Charles Burns left his weekly slot, I moved in, and things kind of mushroomed from there. It's like once you get into a paper in a major city, you're picked up in other papers. Um, so I went from LA to San Francisco, Examiner, New York Press, and then once you're in the New York Press, then the art director from Wall Street Journal contacts you, and things just, you know, cascade. So I don't know the exact time I realized I could make a living from comics, but it is my first love. I've done illustration for major magazines and so on, uh, storyboards for movies, animation, commercials, and anything for a book. Um, and I'm still at it, even though I should be retired by now. But, you know, uh, maybe three or four years. Okay. What if, real quick, what about the things not for a buck, like contributing to women's comics or Twisted Sisters or some of these other things that probably weren't paying such a paycheck? How did you get into that? Uh, invited. Uh -huh. You know, it's like I'm more of a Twisted Sister than a woman's comics. Uh -huh. Um, we're sort of the Rolling Stone to their Beatles. Um, and, you know, I really related well to um, Aileen and Diane, may they both rest in peace. You know, because they, they tried to get the less politically correct, more badass girls in, or women into this thing. What were they seeing of yours that said, oh, we gotta get Carol? I don't know. Yeah. A mystery to investigate. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, Ariel is holding up, Ariel Bordeaux is holding up a f drawing from Spain. <laughs> and, um, here's some 1993 issues of Deep Girl. So what made you, Ariel, uh, realize that you could make comics? And what'd you make? Um, I was kind of, I was reading comics, you know, starting in probably about mm -hmm. high school, um, but as far as, uh, figuring out that I might want to make them. I went through art school thinking I wanted to be a painter. Um, and, and once, you know, I kind of started dabbling in a lot of different things. Uh, I was doing ceramics and jewelry and whatever classes looked interesting. But I was kind of working in a cartoony uh, style more and more. And um, I t had one animation class uh, and I think after I graduated from um, college, a couple years afterwards, you know, I didn't have access to any of the uh, fun studio stuff anymore. Um, and I just, you know, it was sort of adrift. Um, I'm working a minimum wage job at a thrift store and just sort of like, what do I do now um, for the, a couple years after college? And I was gradually sort of seeing mini comics around um, and reading like the uh, back pages or the letter pages of hate where there was always, uh, or maybe at that point, I don't even know if it was hate or neat stuff at that point, mm -hmm. <laughs> but whatever Pete Bag was putting out or, and, you know, in Weirdo, uh, I was, you know, becoming aware that, oh, there's people making these comics themselves. So I don't know, it sort of like was a little bit gradual and then uh, just, yeah, tried, tried it out. Cool. All right, we'll keep going. Um, Anders Nielsen. I think you also have an art school story, right? But so what, when did you uh, first realize you could make comics and what did you make? Um, so my, uh, my mother was a librarian. Um, I grew up in Minneapolis and there was sort of a, sort of a like radical librarian scene there at the time. Um, and there was a guy named Sandy Berman. Uh, if there's any librarians here, they might know that name. But he had a thing called the Berman Routings, which was sort of sending packages of like weird zines and radical literature and self-published and just weird uh, stuff of all sorts around. There would be it'd be like in an envelope, and there'd be a list of people who were interested, and it would just slowly make its way through the system. Um, and my mom would get it, and I would discover all this weird stuff. Um, including, I think it's highly probable that World War III first came uh, to my attention through that. Uh, it's definitely the first time I saw Raw Magazine. 
Um, and I was just like an artsy kid who drew all the time. Start, and I, I think in high school I started uh, obsessing over Fact Sheet 5. Um, but there was definitely a lag. Like I was very excited about Fact Sheet 5 and would just pour over it and think about all the potential it, like cool stuff I could p maybe get. But it didn't really, I didn't make the connection that like I could do this too for several years. Basically until college I started making zines um, in college. And then it was still another like few years before I realized, oh, there's, way, there's a way to get stuff out into the world. Um, I went to school in New Mexico and there was a little like punk rock record and comics shop there for a couple years called Mind Over Matter um, where I, I found like Chris Ware and uh, Jason Lutz and various things and John Porcelino. So I f probably saw the first issue of King Cat there, or not the first, but my first issue of King Cat. And then a few years later I had moved back to Minneapolis and there was an issue of King Cat at a comic shop there and I was just like, how does this guy get his stuff into like different stores, <laughs> different parts of the country? Like he's just photocopying his comics. Um, so I, basically I wrote John Porcelino a letter to be like, how does this work? Um, I had been in art school and was kind of like a painter and an installation artist. But after art school, I just was mostly working in my sketchbooks and I was doing more kind of little, um, uh, crude little comics and at that point I sort of had enough to uh, go to Kinko's and photocopy them and staple them together and um, basically with John's help I figured out like you know how to talk to comic shop owners all over the country. Oh yeah um, so maybe to define a couple of things fact sheet five got mentioned one of you guys want to tell us what fact sheet five was? Um, so it was just like a magazine, the way I remember it, is it was just a magazine with like hundreds and hundreds of listings of self-published zines and mini-comics categorized at, you know, in different like comics, personal zines, like punk rock zines, political <coughs> zines, whatever. Um, I think that's basically... And they had little reviews, too. Yeah, right? and yeah. Every stuff was reviewed, and the address or the you know contact information for people was in there. And it was pre-internet, so there, nobody's email was in there. Um, it's great. Okay, thanks for those intros. We can keep going. Um, I wrote some questions up, and they may be relevant, and they might not be. What did I write? Mm -hmm. um, this is some things you guys can think about. How did you meet your peers? How did you stay in touch? Uh, which festivals, conferences, and network event, networking events did you wind up at? Uh, tell us a story of finding a comic that surprised or inspired you. Um, analog production, any weird stories about analog production. And then Fact Sheet 5 was just talked about. Um, so I wanted to ask, I don't know what specifically I want to ask. I have some early <coughs> story minute from Carol. You mentioned getting that into L LA Weekly, um, but that was after, after your, your stint at Twisted Sisters, right? And even after the Fantagraphics comics? No, before. No. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Well, tell us about, um, more about that. L.A. was really hopping. I mean, okay, I met Matt Groening. He was working at the L.A. Reader, I think in the classified ads department. <laughs> late, late 70s? Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, let me see, I, um, I met him through a, my friend Byron Werner with whom I did a, um, um, a zine you might be interested in called um, Pontiac Tempura. So he's a collage artist. I did comics. Um, and we produced that ourselves. Um, and uh, they're selling for stupid prices on eBay. Um, let me see, what else? But George DiCaprio um, kind of, he, he used to distribute comics around town. And he liked to know everybody and invite us all over to his house for parties or uh, hiking around Silver Lake or uh, whatever. So he, you know, with that, it was like a clubhouse. 
Um, so people like Matt or Gary Panner, uh, Byron, myself, the collector Glenn Bray, um, you know, and then when people came in and out of town like Harvey P. Carr or Melinda Gebby, uh, we would all have a party at George's. And it was just a great way to connect people outside of conventions. Um, but because San Diego Convention was, was relatively small back then, a lot of us would go down there and have a good time. Um, you know, it was nice to meet the Zap artists uh, and go out drinking at the Mermaid Bar or, you know, um, what else? Um, just make connections down there. And what was the question again? Uh, Connecting with people, yeah, basically. I mean, yeah. You know, it's like you answered it with Ellie was hopping, like that was. <laughs> that yeah, was going. yeah. It was a great time, and then, you know, just as an aside, because um, I was one of the few females working in, in comics, it tends to get you more attention. Uh, now it's it's pretty equal, but back then it was it was either an advantage or a disadvantage. Like one of my rejection letters was uh, for sending out my weekly strip was, oh, thanks, but we already have a, a woman cartoonist. <laughs> and I said, like, curse you, Linda Berry. <laughs> um, and uh, well, I'll stop there. I think it's the first time I've heard curse you, Linda Berry. <laughs> 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 Who else has like a a benefactor story or a party story or an impresario story. Let's just go down that route for a moment. And if none um, of you do, then. Well, I, um, in Cleveland, I think there was a small ad that said there's the Cleveland Graphic Arts Society meeting down at a, the YMCA. And Seth and I got his dad to drive us down there. And it was. Um, How old were you? Uh, 11. <laughs> and it was uh, Maggie Thompson and, and Don Thompson were there. And, and, uh, and people. It was a table in a, in a room at the YMCA, and they put comics on the table. And then we would just look at them. And I, that's where I first saw, I saw Zap for the first time. And, um, and then there was some swapping. And uh, eventually, uh, they, and they were doing a little Mimeo magazine. Mimeo was like you'd run it off of this little press, and it would be like purple ink, and probably get you high from smelling the, the uh, toxic uh, chemicals. Um, and um, Seth and I ended up being the editors of that was a Gaslight was the the magazine of the Cleveland Graphic Art Society, um, and that's why it's called that. Yes, and uh, um, and we it gave us the impetus to then uh, when we went to a comic convention to ask somebody for an interview. You know, had a reason like and so you know went up to Jack Kirby and got an interview and William Gaines and. You know, I had a little recorder and I got to you know they were all everybody was sort of available at, at a. New York convention or at, at any convention. And um, um, so uh, th that, that grouping was, that was a good launch. And then, you know, I met other people in comics that way and saw comics that I wouldn't otherwise have seen, particularly like undergrounds. That's amazing. And uh, Maggie and Don Thompson ran a, a magazine called The Comic Buyer's Guide that was weekly for a long, long time. Uh, and so you met them. And yeah, and I mean, Ma and Maggie is still a I see her in San Diego. She's still around. Like, it's just very sort of funny. I forgot what the comic buyer's guide was exactly. Like, it was clearly for collectors, but was it also for new releases? Well, that was a you know that was very much about this panel. That was a, the one of the big connective tissues thing. I'd mm. get this thing, and it would people would have their zines in there, and you'd see something about a convention coming up. Yeah. There was the convention that was in Chicago that um, I got my father to drive me and my friend to, and we got there, and it had been canceled. <laughs> <laughs> I drove from Cleveland. Oh, he hated me so much for that. But who, you know, you didn't know because he was like, "Hey, there's an ad, and it says it's going to be there." And I had this fanzine. And I said, "I want to, I want to sell the fanzine out there." And that was the impetus to get him to drive us there. And oh, well, he was so pissed off on that seven-hour ride back. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, seven hours. Um, maybe we can hear from uh, Ariel and Anders about similar things. Like I know you both met or corresponded with people that got you going. Do you want to start, maybe? Um, yeah, I mean, John Porcelino, for sure. Um, when I first, I mean, I had done a bunch of zines in college and didn't know what to do with them, so I would, like, give them to friends or just, like, put them in a magazine rack at Walgreens or whatever. 
Um, and leave them there? Just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just leave them there or, or leave them in the library or whatever. Um, uh, and then, so I had moved back to Minneapolis. There was a shop there called Big Brain Comics. Uh, Michael Drevis uh, ran that place and I brought, you know, my first sort of more focused like comics minis in. I mean, big questions number one. Um, and he was super supportive. I, I think he probably paid me outright, you know. Um, and then the f he brought a bunch of copies of my comics to XPX in 1999, I guess. Um, I didn't really know what he was doing, but he just handed them out to people. He didn't even sell them or whatever. He was just like, these are cool. I should give them to people who might be interested. Um, and then it was like magic. I got postcards from people who were like, this is cool. Um, and some of them were people I'd heard of, which was bananas. <laughs> um, yeah, and then like it sort of just ballooned from there. Then it was like, I mean, it's interesting to listen to Peter talk about like going as a kid, like going to conventions or going to events and like seeking people out. Like to me, I had to make like six different conceptual leaps to be like, oh, I could connect to other people that do this. Like I was so focused on just like drawing and doing my little thing connecting with other people or the fact that there were even other people out there doing it was sort of like felt like a revelation um but then i think the next year maybe 2000 was the first year i came to spx and then it it was you know connections just happened like i met people who were um also doing it who also lived in chicago and Little by little, it just ballooned that way. You came here, met people that were in Chicago where you were. Yeah, I always, I always saw my Chicago cartoonist friends at shows in other cities wow. much more than I saw them <laughs> in Chicago. <laughs> Ariel, you moved to San Francisco, is that right? Yeah, um, I think the first, um, the first time I like made a made an attempt to to um, connect with my comics through other people, I guess. Um, um, uh, when Pete Bag and uh, Dan Klaus were touring with the Hate Ball tour, in you know whatever that was, 1991-ish or so, or two or three, um, I uh, brought my first mini comic, um, Deep Girl Number One, with me. Uh, it was crazy nervous and like you know put it in there like hi I have this comic and you know <laughs> and uh, they were just like oh okay cool this is and after the, the signing there was a group of local Boston people who kind of met up afterwards at, at, at for a drink or whatever and um, at that so I but I didn't really I uh, stay in Boston for long I moved to San Francisco shortly after that and um, but that was a really helpful intro because it just seemed like I started meeting people really quickly in San Francisco. Um, uh, went to um, Comic Relief on Hate Street and I uh, saw Gabby Gamboa was working there at the time and I just thought she uh, looked so cool and <laughs> I was like, I want to be her friend. And so um, we, you know, became friends and I just, just sort of met various people. I met, um, but uh, Adrian T Tomine I met because I wrote to him um, and sent my comic to like a, ha a handful of people that I had seen in the pages of probably probably Pete's comic. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel like I'm rambling in an incoherent way here, but no, it's all kind of <laughs> like this so far, no. But yeah, yeah, in San Francisco is amazing because pretty soon because of going up to that um, comic relief store, uh, I found out there was a last gas party and went to the mm. last gas party and there was all sorts of artists there. I mean, I'm pretty sure that even Aileen Kaminsky was there and uh, I, w I was just too nervous to even like attempt to <laughs> like approach her, but I just, I sat there, I was with my brother and I just sat there at this party like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> but you know, like pretty soon after that, there was, yeah, um, it was just, uh, a, a great time to be um, in San Francisco. It's very, very easy to meet people. 
When did you start going to festivals and conventions and things? Um, probably within, I, o I was only in San Francisco for maybe like, you know, less than three years, I guess. And so it must have been within that first couple of years that I was there. So I think it was like between 93 and 95. Um, like the, uh, like Ape or something? Yeah, or like the, the San Diego Comic Con oh, and San Ape and, and, you know, Ape as well and whatever else. Like, I think there might have been another one, but those are the two that I remember. Um, Peter, you were the earliest publisher on the panel. Tell us more about making the leap from Gaslight to whatever was next. I don't assume you started World War III when you were like 12. <laughs> um, well, I mean, yeah, the early zines were, we, we did our first one. Uh, Seth, Seth had a, uh, his father had a friend who had a, had a printer, uh, had a printing company, and he printed 100 copies of that first thing you saw. The, Which the, one? The earliest thing up, that. that? Um, yeah, that's a... Uh, kind of faux Jack Kirby, Dan Atkins and Inker did a drawing based on a Jack Kirby um, and uh, uh, he printed it up for free and did like a hundred copies of it that we hand stapled. We, uh, we had, uh, our editorial was, and I think we even did this a little bit in our neighborhood, we printed up a thing that said comics are really important and everybody should be reading comics and this, this important art and we, I went door to door, like, I don't know, probably three or four times where people just looked at us like, what are you, this is insane, you're insane. Wait, and tried that? to hand him out a, fl uh, no, hand him a flyer. Just a flyer about comics? Just a flyer that said, you should read more comics. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we had in our editorial, um, which just hilariously, we forgot to sign it in the, and then it printed, so then we sat and dutifully signed 100 copies. <laughs> um, and, uh, 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 and the editorial was how important comics are and that everybody should read them. And if you want to get these flyers that you can then go around your neighborhood and hand out to people, we'll send them to you, which <laughs> nobody wrote in for, um, as it so happened. But Why <clears throat> did you put down that comics are important to read? Um, y you know, we, we just thought this I mean, was this unsung form, and we were so insanely excited about it that we just thought, like, why isn't everybody onto how great this is? I, you know, it was just like comic fandom. And, and again, you're 11 or 12 of, at this point? Yeah, well, that was when we were 11. <laughs> oh. And we actually we brought this fanzine to, uh, with the remaining, co you know, we given out some. We brought the remaining copies to the, our first New York comic convention in 1971. And there was a comic dealer from Cleveland who said, oh, you know, like, can, we were like, can we put them on your table? And he, he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I came back later. They were all gone. And somebody had stolen them. And then I stood there crying. Oh. I went, you know, a little... 12 years old, we were like, wait, our fans, you know, and then, you know, so there's like, so it's actually a collectible since there's about two <laughs> copies left, so. But who stole them? We have no idea, like, who would want to take Just this, them all at this once? thing of, yeah, just the whole stack was gone. It was so heartbreaking, but we did go on to do other zines, but um, we found printers in different places, and when, you know, one thing that I say that I do miss, if you like think about what, what do you miss now, uh, and you can get this, I suppose, from you know a, a copy shop. But we'd stand by the printing press, and with World War III, we'd go out to a printer that was in Queens, and they have a web press, which is how they print uh, newspapers. And you'd be standing there as it was running on the press, and you'd look, and it, it was in all this funky way it folded down to become the correct thing. You know, pages were all seen backwards, and it would fold down. And that those moments where you, you're smelling the ink, and you're standing around these, you know, these guys printing it and you know and in their you know blue outfits and ink all over their hands and i just you know i missed that aspect of it the direct contact and it it was useful information for a while to know how things printed and physically putting something together gluing it down and assembling a page and having it come out the way you wanted it to and now you can do things digitally you know it's much better in terms of production but we're sending this off to canada to be printed and then it just shows up. So you see it maybe a proof, but you don't get the direct smell the ink quality, which, you know, I miss it, but then there's all the other pluses to the way things are now. Have you ever hand cut a color cover or page? <clears throat> um, well, I mean, we were hand, uh, what did we do? You we, know, like acetate, Ruby the Zipatone. Oh you know, yeah, sure, for the color, for the color. Using that wheel to figure out how many percentages yeah. you do. It's a real yeah. brain buster. Yeah, it's a real brain buster. So you, when you see somebody like Crum who did it so perfectly, because he got learned how to do it at American Greeting. Oh. He was in Cleveland and he, wow. he was doing these. I, th when I was growing up there were, it was like uh, these cards, you know, like 
um, like Hallmark cards in, in a spin rack, and they would be done by, I'd be like, that's Robert Crumb. And it was his early, gentle uh, Robert Crumb. And, but they would be there, and there were these pads and things. Um, that, so Crumb came through town in Cleveland and um, was staying with Harvey Picar. And just through a crazy incident, um, I found a bunch of 78 RPM records in my parents' basement that were left from the previous owner of the house. Mm -hmm. And my parent, we were having a, a house sale, and my parents said, call the owner. If he doesn't want them, you can have them to sell. And I had them outside and back. And a guy came by, and he saw the records, and he wanted to buy all of them. And I went inside, and I remembered Harvey had shown me that he had this incredible record collection. So I called him up, and he said, oh, yeah, don't sell to that guy. <laughs> and he came over, and he said, Crumb would be interested in some of these. I'm like, okay. And he took 15 records and um, uh, did a trade for an interview with Crumb, which my friend Seth and I typed up. And we had, like, you know, we typed it up and left spaces for him to respond. So we're like, you know, what are your hobbies? And it was like, fucking, taking drugs. <laughs> right now, like, eek. And, then, and my favorite was the, could you give us a rundown on the history of underground comics? We left this huge space. And he just wrote, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and which we were like, like what? I can't believe you didn't respond, you know, as opposed to this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and then he came through town and came over to my parents' house, and I was, you know, I didn't draw or anything, so I had nothing to offer besides want to see my comic collection. And he, we did more of a trade, and he did the cover for um, our zine, and I went over to Harvey's. And there was Crumb, like I, after school, I was, I think I was 13 or 14. And um, I was like, I'm ready to pick up the cover that you promised. And he's like, I haven't started it yet. And I was like, okay, I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I look back with embarrassment-ish. But, and so I sat on Harvey's couch and I just stared at Crumb while he started doing this thing. And what did, what did I, I, he was like, well, what do you want me to do? And I was like, a guy trucking. <laughs> All, I, I, I spent so many years in therapy over this, I cannot tell you. But, um, but so while I'm sitting there, at a certain point, Crumb's like, okay, looking over at me, you know, razor looking at him, and, uh, focus, and he gave me a sketchbook to look at to keep me busy, and I, you know, became a, um, a deep Robert Crumb fan in that period. I just couldn't believe what I was looking at. I was going through it, and I'm just like, this is insane, because it's no you pencil. Say you you kind of weren't really at drawing at that point? I, I was I was barely drawing. I you know just yeah. So I had I really had nothing to. My interaction was I just loved comics, but I did some basic. But I started sketchbooking and copying Crumb and all the underground comic zap guys. A lot of Rick Griffin, but um, anyway, I, it was all. I mean, there was a long stretch of embarrassment there because then Crumb became you know like my favorite artist, and I felt like I just was such a dick. <laughs> <laughs> He was a big influence on me as well. And now he's like really hated, you know, because he's totally unfiltered. So he's not politically correct, you know, the his he's he's out there with his uh I don't want to call it sexism because he loves women, but you know, it's not um it's you know, it's like comics they they can't say certain things anymore. Crumb is still saying them. So, um, you know, but just seeing his work, and then he was the first person to ask me to do an autobiographical story, uh, which I did for Weirdo, I think, number 10. And um, he left that comic. Peter Bag came in as editor. So Peter uh, kind of asked me to make one change to it. And it was a great editorial ask. And, um, you know, but Crumb is just a genius. And I, ha I have to defend him sometimes, you know, because other people are just looking at the politically correct way of looking at his things. And it's like, he, to me, he's beyond that. Well, I mean, it's really important. I came to SBX the last time I was here. It was years ago. And there was sort of like a, seemed to be a contingent of people who were like, crumb, Puh. And I was just like, in many ways, most of the people wouldn't be here if it weren't, you know, for the people who were doing it a long time ago who did it the way that we're, you know, still trying to do it. I mean, like, going around with a baby carriage selling Zap comics on Hate Street, you know, one at a time, 
and doing zines, you know, like his early zines he did with his brother. And, you know, all that was, you know, the, it, it helped build the en environment that we have here. And so, you know, even if you, you go like, I'm offended by that, to dismiss it is crazy. We could keep going on that theme because um, comics and, and sort of the precedent that Crum and, and, and his ilk set was you can express what is inexpressible with comics, right? And I'd love to hear from either, any of you like what you felt like, oh, this medium allows me to do this, right? It's, it's, did that happen for any of you? Did you realize at some point, especially the painters, hello, like that comics um, was a really good medium for something that wasn't already coming out in some way? Anybody? I feel like I like um, like my dad had a when I was a kid. My dad had a, a cookbook that Crum had. A, a cookbook. That had uh, let's started. eat. Yeah. yeah, let's eat. Yeah, uh, which I as a kid I remember looking through and just being like, "Whoa, this is bananas." <laughs> um, I feel like by the time I was making comics, I mean it, it's just the way that culture works. Like. Crumb and the Zap, the underground people came along and like reacted violently against what had preceded them. I feel like by the time I was getting sort of serious about comics, it's like Crumb was part of or the the sort of underground style had become more of like the establishment style, and so like <laughs> doing a deep exploration of your sexual neuroses or whatever had had sort of become like a bunch of people had done it and they had sort of covered that ground and it just felt like it wasn't necessary to do it anymore like there was uh, there were other directions to go um, but that said like clearly he was incredibly influential um, and there were things yeah in my work that um, that I I deeply appreciate. I I think the energy of a lot of the the anthologies I was seeing in the um, early days uh, uh, when I was discovering comics, like um, I remember the first time I saw uh, Raw magazine, it was kind of one of the explosions in my brain where I j just like this is completely insane and overwhelming. But then, you know, also like Weirdo was huge for me. Just the energy, all these people doing all these different, you know, the, the variety of artists and there, there's just like this frenzied energy in a lot of that stuff. And then, you know, when I started seeing things like Twisted Sisters and women's comics, that sort of opened a, a door to like, uh, oh, like maybe I, I could do this. and. Um, you know, did, did you ever get blowback for the kinds of things you were saying in your comics? I I don't I don't know. I blow like as far as like blowback like just negative. Yeah, well, like, I mean, you know, uh, I was reading, you know, where you're, you're talking about women and you're, where you're you're looking at this woman and you're commenting kind of like, oh, I thought you know they were probably all all these beautiful women were empty headed, bimbos oh. and all that. That you know, it's the kind of thing that well, if a guy wrote it, it would have been. Frowned upon, shall we say, you know, and you were doing that, and it, it, it was sort of like this very liberating as a reader to have somebody res having a woman respond like that. Yeah, no, I I, I think um, mostly what I was what I was hearing in the early days of doing uh, of Deep Girl is was this um, really positive feedback, and I don't I would get some sort of like. I loved the fact that you could be writing to each other in the mail and you know sharing comics and and that was such so refreshing like coming like coming out of art school critiques which I never I just felt like I wasn't equipped for and I didn't get the language and it just felt so um, it just felt so pretentious and not me and um, so suddenly all like the feedback and critique sort of stuff was happening through the mail and sharing mini comics. So people would sometimes say critical stuff, but I don't I don't remember like that like that type of mm -hmm. point coming up a lot or anything. It was mostly people were like, you know, oh cool, you're doing this, you know <laughs> you're saying it, you're saying it like it is or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's talk a little bit more about tools. You talked about the ink and the web press, and I'd love to hear more about Carol, like how you learned all, all the professional tools you you um, you acquired, and then anyone else who also like had to figure out on their own, like how do you make a comic? You know, how do you? This was back. All of us, I think, worked in the days when you had it had to be line art, you know, and it had to be black, really black, and stuff like that. So I'd love to just hear a little bit about like learning it the hard way, learning it the easy way, mistakes you made, or just how awesome it was, or anything. Well, starting starting as a, you know, doing comics as a letterer, I got really used to speedball and pen nibs, and uh, then I graduated to sable hair brushes ink on good paper. Um, cut to present, paper is bad now. You know, it just bleeds like crazy. It's not just me. Uh, no. Oh. And, you know, so I've got this collection of nibs that I got off of eBay for cheap that I could sell on Etsy for lots of money. But um, I don't know who's using them because the paper is crap. Um, but then... When I was doing, um, I did a comic for DC called The Oz, Oz Wonderland Wars, which is a mashup of things I don't want to think about. Um, and I was copying Tenniel drawings mm -hmm. and John R. Neal from, from the um, uh, Al, uh, Oz books. And learning how to draw with a, with a pen, you know, is like, it's got a totally different uh, feel and result than you get with a brush. Um, so, you know, for a while I was mixing up the two, but about 10 years ago, I got my first Cintiq tablet, and then I just instantly went digital. And it, it has saved me from getting carpal tunnel, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure, and it speeds up my production. At first, I was um, reluctant because it seems to take the soul out of your drawing. You know, I like the mistakes that you get when you're hand doing something. Um, or, you know, seeing a bit of white out on an original, you know, it's okay. But when you have to move a panel from here to here and, you know, shuffle some dialogue around, it's just way better to do it digitally. Um, I use Clip Studio Paint and a little bit of Photoshop. And so it's been an evolution with as far as tools go. And then up on the screen is all brush, I'm going to assume. It's beautiful. I don't see... Yeah, so I used, um, I used pen for the lettering and mm. uh, yeah, brush for everything else. Oh, and the borders are speedball, probably. I can just look at the lines on that, on those like rock towers forever, and I'm sort of in, da in danger of doing that and losing I've, the thread I've of the I've managed <laughs> to, to copy my own style digitally, uh -huh. so I can get a close approximation to how it looks, you know, when I was doing it by hand. Awesome. Um, the, the, catch I, the catch I find to going all digital, though, is you don't have original art. Right. And me personally, that, you know, part of my uh, living is if I can sell original art. And so that when it moves too far, then you just you can have a print. And so I always l personally like to have a, a phase that is a physical something I can hold. And I also right. just never haven't gotten over the that's just uh, the distance is a little far. And I really like the things that happen on paper. I get really nervous when I draw by hand now because there's no control Z. <laughs> <laughs> I want life to be like that personally. <laughs> um. Peter, this is a question I've been meaning to, it's totally related, been meaning to mm -hmm. ask you for like 20 years or something, which is like, what is with the stencils? You mean, the, how the, do you, what the F? Like, what are, you draw with stencils or something? I, I don't, I don't at this point, for uh -huh. the most part, but I did for, for 20 years. Oh, is that where Banksy got his style? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for noting that. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us um, more about that and why it came about and how easy it um, was. Well, actually, it goes back to, to my friend Seth. I, I, I I keep trying different forms to use for doing comics. Um, so I did, I, when I was coming out of art school, I started doing linoleum print. My, I just felt like my drawing was still caught up with 
um, with actually that yeah that's a stencil yeah. um, that's Ronald Reagan yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I feel like it, Ronald Reagan was a font of so much amazing art yeah it was really yeah, it was super easy super easy to draw really in, yeah. in many ways yeah the or hair he, or even just like, like the, um, Ed the happy clown like he doesn't have to look like him but it's like oh, so he just suffused popular culture in such a wonderful way <laughs> a terrible person <laughs> um, so uh, I was doing linoleum for a while but that was super laborious and it didn't dry quickly you, you know printing and it's it flips backwards I did a, a, a book on using those and, and a few comics but it was it was too labor-intensive but my drawing if I did pen and ink I felt like I had too much old comic influences in me and just didn't came, it came out it didn't it wasn't I wanted to remove myself I have some stage in there and Seth was had done a stencil and we did a few stencils together and I just had one of those moments where I looked at that form and I was like that's that's what I want to do and I want to do comics in that because uh, it was another way to show like something that um, isn't used in comics. And so like when somebody says, oh, I know what a comic is, it has word balloons and it has these panels and it's done in pen and ink or however, whatever the forms it were, but stencil and spray paint was, wasn't one of the ways that people did comics. And so when I had the opportunity to do the system for DC Vertigo, it was this wordless book, then I, I was like, I'm gonna do it in stencils and spray paint and I will, to try and move, like move the, argument for comics forward, you know, it's basically handing out that flyer door to door. <laughs> um, Did you, was it at all connected to like street art? To, stuff? Yeah, it was I, totally. I know that at that time in New York, there was a huge sort of art. It, exactly. Thing. Yeah, that's what, and Seth was doing some of that and we did a few things, stencils together. What I found though was, you know, to do one that was on the street, you'd be doing it like in cardboard or in something where you had to do like multiple strokes to do a cut. I started photocopying my pencil drawings and then than cutting on this simple photocopy paper fairly easy. And I could cut an area that wanted to be black almost as fast as I could ink it in. Really? And got pretty dexterous with it. And so when I was asked to try out for Spy versus Spy, I thought, I don't want to just try and mimic the style. And I really thought I didn't want the job, which I, I was wrong about uh, 28 years later. Oh my God. Um, uh, and so I thought, I'll do it in a style that, it, that will definitely be my own thing if they, if they go for it. And that, so I did uh, Spy vs. Spy in stencils for about 10 years. Um, but it's just, I was actually working with cans with spray paint and, you know, pick up a red can, spray it, and it makes the paper kind of waffle around. And then, and then I'd spray black and I could aim it a little bit so you get a little glow of red, but you never could fully control it. And I just loved any medium where I didn't know what the outcome was until I lifted up the stencil. And then you could work with it a bit, but it was still did its own thing and that was out, out of my, and it broke my bad drawing habits, I felt. Amazing. Real quick, is there a spray can setting on Procreate? I'm, I'm sure there, there isn't. I mean, now I use, I have, I have like model sprays and I can take a drawing and then select the black area and then move it over to the, this just sprayed stencil that has some stippling in it and grab that and then, oh, I don't hear that. and then um, make it look like that if, I, if I'm so inclined. <laughs> but, but uh, to, you, you know, I, you need a spray booth. There was That's also something, there was also something about doing like pro environment things and yeah. I'm going, <laughs> 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 you know, well, at least it's being blown out the window. You know, so there was a lot of contradictions there, so. Okay, I, I'd love to hear from Ariel and Anders about just learning the tools and whatever, whatever that went through, and then we'll open it up for questions. Does that sound all right? Um, I'm still learning the tools. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think when I got sort of serious about comics, I tried to start using nice materials like rapidographs and they were just such a pain in the ass they'd always clog at like three in the morning and then you'd be just like screwed um so i use pretty straightforward just like stetler sort of disposable pens i i still draw on paper i like i like doing the cutting and pasting to fix stuff my originals are full of um white ink correction stuff I also, as I work, I put my originals up on the wall so I can kind of look at the whole issue together and like reread it and stuff. So that's, that's part of my process. Um, after 
meeting, starting to meet other cartoonists at SPX and Ape and other shows. I got connected to a couple people in Chicago, including Paul Hornschmeyer, who um, was internet savvy for one thing, which is beyond the bounds of this panel, but uh, he also knew about pre-press um, and that was that was a huge help just like helping us all figure out like okay you have a drawing like now what how do you make it into a book or whatever oh yeah do we have oh th we don't have 90 minutes no, no. oh shit <laughs> we have one question do we have time for one question one question all right i'll tell you what i'm gonna say uh Grab a card, you'll find out more about this project. Get on the mailing list, and, I'll, and maybe a, if you have any questions, I'll send them to the panel, and, uh, and maybe they'll res respond. I thought we had 30 more minutes. <laughs> One question, <laughs> hurry. Uh, the mics are fixed. Well, can I just get a room if someone has questions? Nobody's got a question. All right, what did I, I miss? I got a question. Go, please. No. Okay. <laughs> Is that Anna? Yes. Hey. Hi. Quickly, sure. So, so, something um, you said, Peter, about like just um, just trying to like move the medium, like trying different mediums. I like that in current comics, you um, are see there's just a wild variety of how many different mediums people are trying and like techniques for how to make comics. Um, yeah. I I do think there's a lot of a lot of sort of one thing I don't like is. I don't know. I don't want to hate on anything really, but it's just it, the 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 digital thing to me. I'm just um, struggling with because there is I'm like, how do I f find the humanity in the digital world? You s like the way I'm encountering comics is constantly like just you know seeing a little clip of it on Facebook or something, and it's just it's making me crazy. <laughs> Um, for me, I'm just glad that there are there's a wider variety of people in comics. It used to be like guys, that was just it, and there were like almost zero women. White guys. Women. Yeah, white guys. Yes, exactly. It was all it was all just you know one one general direction, and that's completely changed for the the way better. Um, and the thing I miss and don't like is that the community. It, there's nothing, it's what's good about it, which is that there's all this stuff, but it also used to be a more intimate community that I could read most everything that was coming out from alternative comics and I can't keep up now. I love that there's so much talent out there now. It's like, where did they all come from and how are they gonna make a living? Um, I think that, that mm -hmm. the internet, like I don't do the internet thing um, and younger, people seem to understand it well and are flourishing that way, great. I'm so in awe of that. Um, and I'm disappointed that publishing has uh, just tanked. You know, there's, um, there's less money for doing actual paper comics now or magazines have folded. You know, other avenues that, we, that used to sustain us have just disappeared. I'll just second what, what Peter said. It's really nice to feel like things are opening up. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, please give a round of applause to these four geniuses. Um, and thanks for putting up with a panel with no Q&A, which I really had 30 minutes to plan for. <laughs> please grab a card and go to the podcast and uh, sign up for the mailing list, and, and uh, if you are somebody who did comics in that time period and want to uh, contribute your oral history on the card as a little QR code, and we'd love to record that too. We put, we're putting all these, um, as I said, in the University of Florida our digital oral history archives. Um, we want people to know, you know, in 20 years there's going to be a panel that's going to be like, what was comics like before AI? And people are like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, so you'll be on that panel. <laughs>